much closer to the truth. I think maybe we can get a little closer to the truth, but the, definitely there were, I think, a, a high alien superior civilization on the earth in the past, and I think some aspect of that created us and put us here for some reason, and we are yet to figure out the reason, obviously. We don't even yet accept that that's how we got here, but but through my work and the work of others like me, we can move us in that direction. The star child is certainly going to give us a huge leap in that direction. And then once, you know, once those theories are accepted as plausible and, and real, then we can begin, I think, to move in, the, in that right direction. And that's the, that's the importance of the Star Child Skull, of the documentary, of the book, of all of it, of all of it. And that's why it's important for people to make themselves aware of this, because this is the thing. This is the wedge. This is the lever that we're going to be able to apply to all the really the ignorance that's out there and is accepted now as true. Truth. How about uh, Von Doniken, his work? Well, I think he listen. He's the grandfather of us all, and we all owe him a huge, a huge debt of gratitude for for what he's done. Same thing. Not right in every single thing that he did, but he certainly did a lot of very good work. And and uh, again, one man working this this whole brand new field, you're going to take some wrong paths. You have to. Uh, and and we all stand on the shoulders of giants. That's the way it works. And and I. I applaud him and Sitchin and all the you know the early uh, pioneers of this field. They they did great work. Lloyd, you continue with your work. It hasn't ended yet. You're you're still doing more research. You've got uh, more things to do. Uh, let's talk about some other things that you plan to do to get to the bottom of all of this. Well, the you know obviously the the star child is the main thrust right now. I, I'm going to continue to do my work on human origins with the the research that I'm doing for everything you know is wrong, and I continue to to go in that direction. I want to continue my work with hominoids because I think that's just as important as the alien UFO question because it, it's all together. If if we are indeed put here, genetically engineered and put here, then what are what are called the the prehumans? Those those skeletons are there, those fossils are there and they have to be explained. Well if you accept that hominoids are real then the prehumans are taken care of. So it all all the work that I do fit it, it seems disparate, but it all fits together seamlessly in the end. That's how you make the picture clear to the future to those that don't understand it. You you show how the prehumans are not humans at all. They're they're actually hominoids that have walked out of the Miocene era, which is from 25 million years ago to 5 million years ago, walked out of that whole you know, 20 million year period on two legs, right to today, around the world, every continent except Antarctica, four different types, the hobbit being one of those types, mm -hmm. the little kind. And so then that leaves us without a place, human beings without a place in the fossil record. And so it makes, it's just added proof that we are genetically engineered and recently put here. And, and that's the whole thrust of my work and what I do, and I'm going to continue to do that. And this documentary should hopefully give me a, a much larger platform to get you know, to get these messages across to people. And eventually somebody, you know, somebody in the right high places are going to have to listen. They're going to do it unwillingly. But it's just we're going to be able to cram it down their throats. And I think this documentary and the, the test that's going to, that the star child is going to go through, the 454 Life Science um, testing procedure, is going to prove it at a level of scientific accuracy that just, just can't be argued with. And that's that's what makes it exciting, and that's what makes it so valuable. Now, you said something about the hobbits. You said the little ones. Right. Does that kind of implies that there are big ones? Yeah, there, there are four kinds of hominoids, George. There's the, the big kind, the Bigfoot Sasquatch kind, um, seven to nine feet tall, 700 to 1,000 pounds. There are two basically man-sized kinds. There's the Almas kind, which are five to seven feet tall, 300 to 500 pounds. There's the abominable snowman kind, which is very unique. They're, they're the most primitive of the four. The Yeti type? The Yeti type, exactly that. And then there's the, the Sadapa, Agagui, 
and now hobbit type. They were known as sadapas and agagwis before, but they're found in the band of jungle that circles the equator around the globe. And they were always known to be in Indonesia and, and, and places like where the hobbit was found. And, and, and the people on the island say these are just the little hairy people that live in the, in the jungles. And that you know that's what every and everyone there agrees that the, these pe- these these beings have existed alongside them all the way. Science, of course, doesn't want to accept that, and so they've done everything they can to make it seem like the Hobbit is just some kind of a dwarf, weird, mal-shaped, malformed human being, just like they try to do with the Star Child. And yet, there's just been there's been some recent proof in looking at the wrist bones of the Hobbit that shows very clearly that they're not human. I mean, uh, I've got that picture on the on your website as well, so people can see that analysis of those wrist bones, and which shows clearly that the hobbits are not human beings. They are much more like primates. Therefore, I say, I argue that they are nothing more than the, the pygmy type hominoids that are have been well known for, for decades. How many different creatures do you think there have been on the planet in terms of species that uh, have been altered or, or, or genetically uh, manipulated? I think that all of the so-called uh, domesticated plants and domesticated animals have been genetically engineered to make them domesticated. They have all signs of, of work done to them that nature just doesn't do. Now, like like a chimp or a primate, uh, a chimp or a gorilla, rather, those are just natural beings, you know, natural animals. To this planet. Uh, to this planet. But a cheetah? Now, a cheetah is clearly, clearly a genetically engineered uh, animal. It's it's an absolute cross between a dog and a cat. It's got dog and cat fur on its body. It's got a cat body, but it's got dog feet because uh, to run at the 70-mile-an-hour speed that a cheetah runs at, it can't make its turns on cat feet. It has to have dog feet. It has to have permanent claws stuck out there and big, heavy pads to make, like, track shoes on it, or it can't make its cut. So uh, and 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 cheetahs get um, dog diseases and they get cat di- diseases that are specific to dogs and specific to cats. They are very very fragile. Their the sperm of their males is like forty percent uh, motile. They. That's not nature. Doesn't do that. Nature doesn't produce those kinds of problems. Um, a cheetah is clearly a designed animal, and, and there are others as well. Uh, cats go. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, excuse me, like house cats, but cattle, sheep, goats, all of those. According to, to Sitchin and according to the Anunnaki, these all these things, these animals and these plants, corn, wheat, all that, were created to, quote, I love this phrase, give the gods their ease, meaning <laughs> to make life easy for the gods. They created everything they needed here to make their life comfortable. And that's where suddenly, remember, all this happens within about 10,000 years. What, suddenly you have this explosion of, of domesticated plants and animals, and then we don't make any more. There just no more appear. We can't create any. Nobody creates any. No more new ones come. But within that 10,000-year period, it seems like all of them appear. How does that happen naturally? Well, it doesn't. It's just it's just stupid to pretend that it is otherwise. And these are these are things that I talk about already in in everything you know is wrong in the old version, and I'll just expand on that in the new version when it comes out. Interesting facts about a cheetah from standing start: a cheetah can reach forty five miles an hour in two seconds and seventy at top speed. Yeah. Can you believe that? Well, and not only that, it's the easiest uh, big cat to domesticate. They were domesticated in all the great temples and uh, of the kings of Egypt and all over in Asia. uh, The Chinese court, you know, they they were they're very easy to domesticate. It's like they're built to be servants of humans. It's like they're built to be hunters for humans. You know how we have birds of prey that go out and hunt for us and bring you know bring it back. Cheetahs can do can and will do the same thing. You take them out, they'll hunt for you and bring it back. Without eating. Yeah, and you give them a piece of it, and that's their reward, and it's like it's a teamwork thing. So, um, yeah, they they are they they are our like shotguns, basically the you know the primitive shotgun. Just send them out there, and they'll get it and bring it back to you. Lloyd, what has your life been like with all these various investigations? Hominoids, Star Child. Has it been turned upside down? 
N- no, you know it's it's hectic and it's it's challenging, but I I really love it. I, I don't make I don't make a lot of money. I got to tell you, anybody that that you just don't make money in this field. You know that. You know it as well yeah. as I do. Yeah. 